Hi there, and welcome to Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, and you can learn all about me uh, on Instagram at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. Today I'd like to start with an excerpt from a book called Saved by a Poem by Kim Rosen. When you get to know a poem well, you may find that you naturally begin to remember the words. Lines may come to you seemingly out of the blue, or you may find yourself quoting a phrase at a crucial moment when nothing else will do. At that point, you may choose to go even deeper to learn your poem by heart. Often people balk at the idea of committing a poem to memory. Phantoms of childhood humiliations and middle-aged failures crowd the mind. That second grade performance of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs where you played Sneezy and forgot your only line. Your fumbled solo at the high school glee club's Messiah. Last week's embarrassing failure to remember the name of your best friend's cat. But none of these has anything to do with memorizing and remembering a poem. Learning by heart is not the same as memorizing. Strangely enough, It does not require a good memory. I have a terrible memory. I can't remember where I hid my computer password, much less the password itself. I too forget the name of my brother-in-law's mother and who wrote the Declaration of Independence. Yet when I fall in love with a poem, something about my hunger to taste it again and again, enter its world and discover what new territory it will show me within itself or within myself, The process of learning it happens naturally. I have stood with many trembling students at the brink of poems they never thought they could learn. Watch them finally dive into the process, submerge, and rise up sprouting the words in a way no one else ever could. So I know this is possible for anyone. When you love a poem enough to allow it to guide you into your own intimate experience of its words, breath, and pulse, learning it by heart happens effortlessly. Regardless of whether you ever learn a poem by heart, there are hundreds of other ways to nourish your connection with poems that that move you. Create a poetry journal by filling blank books with handwritten copies of your favorites in the order in which they touch your life. Or start a salon with a group of kindred souls to meet regularly and share aloud the poems that are speaking most deeply to you. You can also create your own poetry cards, each with lines from your favorite poems. Call on them for inspiration and guidance as you might a divination card or or give them to loved ones at pivotal moments when only poetry can express what cannot be told in ordinary speech. One of America's great poets, Stanley Kunitz, said, A poet's work is not only to avoid cliches of language, but also to avoid cliches of thought and feeling. Cliches are familiar patterns of reaction that arise automatically without consciousness. These habitual responses can be the cause of much suffering because they lead to some painful situations again and again. As William Wordsworth says, Not choice, but habit rules the unreflecting herd. Because it goes underneath conventional thought. Poetry can cut through these patterns, waking you up to the vibrancy of the moment. In this way, filling your mind with poetry can offer profound paradoxical medicine. It strengthens the mind and disarms it all at once. Among spiritual seekers, there is sometimes a tendency to disparage the mind, as if it were essentially adversarial to the experience of truth. Yet, while the reality of the true self cannot fit into the borders of the mind, that same mind has one extraordinary capacity that makes it essential to the path of awakening. The mind can use itself to shatter itself. In the aha that happens when the mind bursts open, at a breathtaking metaphor, 
or an insight or a chiming among the words, all levels of being human come into alignment. You feel a sudden integration of body, mind, heart, and soul. The fragmentation that many experience in the multitasking onrush of modern life cannot withstand a good poem. Whether it is a mystical psalm by Kabir asking, What is God? or a poem by June Jordan about being homeless in New York City, you are called into presence by the resonance of truth. And when you are present, you are open to your feelings. And when you feel, the rigid boundaries that divide you from others can melt. In that moment, the man sleeping on the subway vent, the child shot in Fallujah, the little girl in the FEMA trailer, and your own mother, whether or not she seemed to love you, are no longer separate from you. They are you. These thoughts come from a book called Awaken by Priscilla Shearer. Elisha asked her, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? 2 Kings 4, 2. A common link nearly always exists between our needs and God's answers. A thread woven into the fabric of our relationship with the Father that if overlooked can cost us the most intimate and majestic experience with him possible on this side of eternity. And in 2 Kings 4, this critical strand is clearly marked for all of us to see. A woman bereft of husband and financial stability came to the prophet Elijah requesting help. Creditors were demanding payment for the debts she owed, threatening even to take her children away as part of the bargain. She was desperate, crying out, unable to pay, unable to do much at all. The man of God graciously listened to her plight. He asked how she thought he could assist her. But before even waiting for her response to that question, he posed another, more vital one. What do you have, he asked, in your house? What resources are already available to you? How easily we point to our lack. How specifically we highlight our deficiency. How quickly we become consumed with the glaring evidence of all that's working against us, the hardships that are pressing us again into such desperate straits. We are far less inclined to accentuate the gifts and blessings that remain. But Elisha, in refocusing the widow's attention on the meager pot of oil sitting there amid all her difficulty and hardship, forever changed the way she would look at her most heart-wrenching need. It can change the way we look at ours, too. Like a glint of sunshine passing through ominous clouds on a dreary day, hope pierced through the darkest darkness in her home. The foundation for a miracle was right under her nose. If only she would take the time and energy required to go and look. If only she would become as invested in expecting God's answers as she'd been invested in lodging her complaints. What do you have in the house? In your house, within your reach. Sometimes we wait impatiently on God when he is patiently waiting on us. Waiting for us to recognize what he's already given as part of the answer to our problem. What little pot of oil have you neglected to notice? What little shred of possibility have you chosen to ignore? What little patch of time have you disparaged? What little hints of blessing have you criticized as insufficient? What little humble beginnings have you shoved to the back shelf, considering them unworthy of being the basis for God's miraculous intentions? Maybe the answer you've been praying for is already there. A plain-as-day response from God to your plea, immediately ready to be applied to this situation. God will always be faithful to help you through 
the desperate challenges you face. Some things, obviously, only he can do. But take a good look around to see what's already at your disposal. That little jar of oil may well be the beginnings of the most spectacular move of God you've ever seen. I wrote a book called My Creative Peace, Finding and Deepening Your Creative Voice While Connecting with God. And here was an interview that I wrote that I had with a, an artist named Amy Lee Weeks. The name of her business is Hidden in My Heart. And she actually has a line uh, with the um, Christian version of Hallmark that you can be sure to check out. Amy Lee Weeks is a follower of Jesus. He directs her paths, literally. She says, through many life experiences, through all life experiences, he has amazingly molded my life, my heart, and given me this gift of artistic ability. The quote that explains this best is by my favorite author, Oswald Chambers. My personal life may be crowded with small, petty happenings, altogether insufficient. But if I obey Jesus Christ in the seemingly random circumstances of life, they become pinholes through which I see the face of God. I am a mother of two girls that have pure hearts and active imaginations that require many props. And my life's mission is to love and grow those imaginative hearts. My girls are my life. She says, I am a wife to an amazing husband. I am so blessed to have found him in this crazy world. After losing my fiance when I was 24 because of a car accident, I was able to open my heart and find the love of my life again. He is an amazing dad, amazing husband, and my anchor in this crazy, crazy world. She says, I am an artist. It is my therapy and my passion. I battle with depression and combining my faith and my art together helped me heal my heart. My hope is to bring the same peace to others through my art. I am a country girl. I am an Iowa girl. I love fishing, camping, and need a lot of open space around me to breathe. Oh, and I cannot live with my country music twang. My art is hidden in my heart. In my heart. Based on Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart. It takes his word in my heart to keep me chugging along through my ridiculously busy and sometimes heart-lifting, sometimes heartbreaking days. My art is hidden in my, in my art. All art pieces I create have the Lord's word incorporated into it. Whether it is easy to find or hidden, it is there. My art is hidden in my heart. A personal blueprint for my art and is only through faith, prayer, and worship and life experiences can I find that art and share it. What is one of your earliest creative memories? She says, my earliest creative memory is sitting at my grandma's kitchen, kitchen table while she taught me and my sister how to draw a portrait. My grandma was an amazing artist. Her works still hang in many homes. Did you have creative habits that made a smooth transition into your adult life? What did the evolution look like? My, creati my creativity while growing up was geared more towards writing and crafting, floral arrangements, mosaic creations, collages, cross-stitch candle making. I have files and files of poems, short stories, and music lyrics that I have written throughout the years. Many fa family members have floral and other crafty art creations from me throughout their homes. Not until after business college did I find this love for drawing, sketching, and painting. I dabbled in many art forms, but it honestly wasn't until I enrolled in an art college in 2006 that I really seriously took the leap from casual crafter to artist in my heart. My creative life has definitely been an evolution, taking with me all that I learned from one creative endeavor to the next. If you had a creative hiatus, what event circumstance brought you back to your creative lifestyle? 
A few years in business college, I wasn't that creative or crafty. I was so busy. My creative life came back when I started writing again. I, sur I wrote many, many song lyrics. I even had some looked at by a, na a record company in Nashville. Other than that, I don't remember a time when I wasn't creating something. How has God been a part of your creative process and lifestyle? Everything that has been brought into my life, good or bad, has a purpose. He is a plan for my life. He breathes into me his desire. He continues to whisper it into my heart. If the shouts return stating you are not enough to be an artist, I turn away from my art, but the whispers always bring me back. Is there a particular moment where your creativity became infused into your spiritual practice? Throughout my life, my creativity has stemmed from life experiences. I would write something, draw something, or create something from a life experience. I was very reactive with my art. It truly wasn't until I started a spiritual art journal and created art out of a scripture that spoke to me did I find the, the spiritual connection. It is only through prayer and worship that I am able to strip out my intentions and let God speak to me through these art pieces. Thanks so much for stopping by. Make sure and look up our other, my other um, episodes in these podcasts if you're enjoying them and pass them along if there's someone you think will need them.